If there's anyone out there that still denies the fact that chemtrailing is happening, take a look at this video and please explain what it is that we're seeing here. The internet is all abuzz about how geoengineering has finally made it to the mainstream, but I feel like it's nothing but another delaying tactic. Stay tuned and find out why. Welcome to Unbiased and On the Fence. I'm Shane. Last week on November 8, 2017 in Washington, the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology met to discuss the feasibility of geoengineering. Now, I gotta tell you right off the bat, it was like a big pink elephant in the room watching this whole thing go down. It was like almost like everybody got a memo for this thing saying, all right, here's the talking points. Uh, nothing's happened yet. We're just now discussing it. Uh, it will be decades before we implement anything. If there's any opposition, make it the opposition to climate change because there was not a single mention of our skies we see on a daily basis and the chemtrailing that we see that stripes our skies up constantly. Now, this was almost two hours of boring, but I sat through it. I edited it down just to a few minutes. So I know it's, it's, it's actually, it got pretty entertaining the shorter it got because it, you began to see this common theme that I'm speaking about. Take a look at this. Joint hearing on geoengineering innovation research and technology is uh, called to order. While there are at least a few programs in our nation's universities that are looking into these concepts, Federal research is still limited. If in the future the government wants to actually apply the concepts and findings of geoengineering research, since the theories and concepts involved are still so new, we cannot say definitively if geoengineering technology warrants full-scale development or deployment. The purpose of this hearing is to discuss the viability of geoengineering and any early stage research associated with this approach. The hearing is not a platform to further the debate about climate change. The Science Committee is discussing geoengineering a field of science and engineering that is still in its infancy and has geoengineering is an option our country should explore. The state of current geoengineering research makes clear that we are years or perhaps decades away from potential deployment and the risks of deployment are not well understood. This is because of a lack of technical maturity and understanding of the risks associated with geoengineering. What are the hypothetical alternatives and how do we go how do we best go about determining their feasibility, costs, and impact? While this technology is interesting, we have a lot to learn. Some have questioned the unintended consequences of geoengineering. One concern is that brightening clouds could alter rain patterns, making it rain uh, more in some places or less in others. Such technologies could drastically reduce global temperatures in the future by spraying aerosols into the atmosphere to reflect sunlight. As the climate continues to change, geoengineering could become a tool to curb resulting impacts. Today we are going to hear from a panel of experts on the status of America's research in geoengineering, a field truly in the scientific unknown. Geoengineering has the potential to provide us with a whole new understanding and approach to atmospheric research. Geoengineering in particular is in its very early stages and more research is required to expand our understanding of its risk and potential benefits and potential small scale field tests in the coming decades. We don't yet know whether geoengineering should be a part of the strategies addressing climate change. It'll take at least a decade to sort out the benefits, risks and trade-offs associated with these different technologies. That program should include modeling, lab studies, small scale field studies, in addition to addressing societal needs for transparency and governance. But there's still considerable uncertainty into the side effects and risks, and that will require focused, goal-oriented research that could take decades, at least a decade, maybe more. It will take a decade of core technology development and basic science to determine if any options are feasible, and another decade to scale capabilities for readiness. Um, do any of you know if there have been field tests uh, on geoengineering that have carried out uh, by other countries? Do these people even look up at the sky? I'm not aware of any. So we don't need to be worried about them doing large-scale deployments? I don't think we need to be worried about anybody doing large-scale deployments. It would take 20 years to decide on whether we have a, 
a good enough understanding to decide that it might be useful to do this or not if we're working on, if we're going all out on it uh, yeah I think it, I would just reiterate that a lot of the sort of smaller scale field experiments that scientists are presently proposing to do are, are going to be uh, unnoticeable to the untrained eye you need a really fancy experimental setup and right. cool instruments to to even detect that it's going on right okay <laughs> okay the small Never mind. Um, well, we don't yet have any technology for producing aerosols of the type and at the scale that we're talking about for this. And until we know what the limits of those technologies are, what we're inputting to our models is very much guesswork. If we want to support informed decisions in 10, 15, 20 years, discussions are, are beginning. But, you know, as we kind of see here today, this is a new topic for conversation, particularly for a lot of policymakers. So they're sort of at their early stages. You know, I've got to wonder, do these people ever look up? I mean, think about this. These are doctors in the field that they work in. They have doctorates in what they do. This is the brightest minds in the field, yet they don't notice what's going on in the sky. I mean, really? Okay, let's do a little bit of a recap in case you missed it. Decades away. In the coming decades. It'll take at least a decade. That could take decades, at least a decade. It will take a decade and another decade. Decisions in 10, 15, 20 years. It would take 20 years if we're going all out on it. I just, I don't really know what else I can possibly say to that. Uh, I think uh, one distinction I discovered uh, in this whole process that I've been looking, because I've been looking at this for years, and I kind of thought the debate was over because there was these weather modification companies you can go to that uh, will seed clouds and things like that. But in the process of checking all this out, I realized that cloud seeding is a completely different process. It's done by smaller planes like Cessnas uh, where they burn these flares at a much lower altitude. And what we see with the chemtrail skies is uh, much higher altitudes with much bigger tanker planes spraying these aerosols in the actual stratosphere, not down at the level of the clouds, typically where you would see cloud seeding performed. And cloud seeding has been going on on the record since the 1940s and, and before that. Northwest happened as early as the 1940s. So, if these are the people that would be responsible for geoengineering uh, to reduce global warming and things like that, then these aren't the people that spraying the skies. Now, I already know it's the military doing it. People are waking up all the time. And even people that work within the field where it's happening right under their noses. Let's listen to Luke Radowski of We Are Change talk with Kristen Megan, the so-called whistleblower that discovered this was really happening, and she even tested the air, water, and soil for traces of the compounds used for chemtrailing. This is the Gradowski of We Are Change at Oregon. I'm here with Kristen Megan. Um, I wa was in the Air Force on active duty for nine years, and I worked in bioenvironmental engineering. Um, after it being brought to my attention about chemtrails or geoengineering, I, I used to think it was crazy. It actually was disrespectful to my line of work because here we are trying to prevent environmental aspects and impacts um, and not have anybody get sick from our operations. But in, in an attempt to debunk I started noticing things. I started noticing large quantities on the system where I would approve chemicals that did not have a manufacturer name, wasn't tied to a building, and that, that was normal protocol. At first, when I saw these large quantities of aluminum, barium, strontium oxides and sulfates, I thought, well, this could be for an industrialized process for something called shot peening or, you know, bead blasting, things that you see in kind of the automotive industry. Except those were already accounted for. I already knew how much was used for those processes. It was a little type of different constituent. And the first thing I did, part of my job was to sample air, soil, and water. So that's what I did. I, I air sampled the soil, the air, and the water. And due to my profession, I know at which levels or limits of detection you need to check that at. And the amount of pollution that was in my area, and this is tests I did in Oklahoma, 
you know, in Georgia, in Chicago, where I am now. Um, but in taking those samples, I knew the background because a lot of these things are naturally occurring yeah. and elemental, but not in this form and not in this quantity. So how did it get there? So one of the things I discovered, if you do sort of break in through the deception of this, you come across this, well, we're doing it to reduce global warming. Uh, but I think if the military is doing it, we can pretty much bet it's not to reduce global warming. I think that makes it apparent that something bigger is afoot. Now, the whole reason I'm even bringing this topic up, because I typically stay away from it, it's been covered a lot, but what I've been observing lately, I haven't heard anyone talking about. Now, if I'm standing outside next to a pool or a pond and a pebble or an acorn drops into the water, and I don't see it or hear it, but I look down at the water to observe ripples going across there, I'm going to wonder what's causing those ripples in the water. And that's exactly what I've been observing in the sky. And I haven't heard anyone talking about it. So I wanted to bring this out because I think it's important that we are aware of what's going on, that we recognize when something new comes on the scene. Now I did a video, a few videos back, showing how the ISS was looping their feed, their supposed live feed from the space station. And you could clearly see that they were playing the same footage eight days apart and one of the main reasons I started recording it the first time was because I was noticing on the ISS feed these ripples in the clouds from space and so I wanted to document it. You can see it from space. I've also been observing it from the ground from where I live and it's been showing up picture after picture. I've been noticing it since around the time of the hurricane. Rare wave clouds spotted across central Indiana. Indianapolis. Did you see the crazy clouds spotted across central Indiana Friday morning? SkyTrack 13 meteorologist Sean Ash says they're a somewhat rare type of wave cloud. They're called Angelatus Asperatus, which is Latin for agitated wave. According to the Weather Channel, Angelatus Asperatus sightings are strikingly visual reminders that the atmosphere is an ocean of gas complete with cloud waves crashing high above. They occur when enough atmospheric instability or rising air is available to create widespread cloud cover as well as wind shear and turbulence, which creates the wavy rough sea-like visual effect. Now I'm just purely speculating, but I've seen these rare clouds becoming less rare all the time. I've noticed the size of the wave decrease as well. Undulatus asperatus wasn't even a classified cloud type until recently. It's been an ongoing debate for some time. New cloud formation, Undulatus asperatus seeks official status. This was in September of 2012 on Red Orbit. Again. The Daily Mail a couple of years ago. Will this be the first new cloud type in 60 years? Angelitis Asperatus seeks official classification in International Atlas. Earth's newest cloud is terrifying. This from March 24th, 2017, or just earlier this year. You can see the clouds here in this time lapse video. In 2014, I spoke with Gavin Preter Penny, the founder of the Cloud Appreciation Society about his quixotic mission to get recognition for a new category of cloud called Angelatus Asperatus. For years, individuals from across the world had been sending him pictures of the unusual formations, trying to figure out what they were. But they had no official name. Yesterday, on World Meteorological Day, nine years after the classification was first submitted, the World Meteorological Organization finally recognized Preter Penny's clouds in the updated version of the International Cloud Atlas, though the name has been tweaked to Asperitas. They're the first new addition to the atlas in over half a century. There were 12 additional cloud classifications added to the atlas in 2017. And as you see, Control is listed as a cloud and there's derivatives from contrails, clouds that's created from the contrail, as they're calling it here. On the surface, you could say this is due to global warming and extreme weather conditions that 
weren't the norm half a century ago. But in light of other evidence with the chemtrailing, HARP, and other government programs, you have to wonder, are these man-made occurrences? So there's these iridescent rainbow clouds, rainbows of all sorts. They've got these ones where it's like a halo around the sun, a halo around the moon. Uh, whenever you see the iridescence or the rainbow around the sun, uh, either in part or totally, they call it a sun dog. So a lot of these things are just new to me in general. But these uh, patterns that you see, these lines that appear like there's ripples in the clouds, uh, these I'm seeing uh, in increasing numbers. So my whole point with all of this is, it's clear that they've classified chemtrails as contrails. What else are they not telling us? Are these other clouds that look like ripples and wave clouds, are they really man-made as well? I came across another video where the guy felt just as I did when he saw these clouds, that it was created by HARP or some kind of scalar technology. When you look at it, it's clear that it's some sort of standing wave pattern that's affecting the cloud. So clearly, they're beaming some kind of energy into the clouds or using the clouds to move energy. Or I'm not even going to pretend like I know what dropped into the pond and created the ripples, so to speak. Was it a rock? Was it a pebble, an acorn? Somebody toss a penny in there? I don't know. But I do see the ripples. I just think this is something we should be aware of and be on guard about because something's going on. I can't say I know what it is, but something is definitely going on. I want to thank each and every one of you for supporting me all this time, hitting that like button and subscribing. For those who really like the channel and you want to help me grow it, you can do me a huge favor. One of the channels I watch all the time, High Impact Flicks, is now promoting small channels just like this one. Also, if you guys know about a small channel creator you're impressed with and want me to feature them, let me know in the comments. I'm going to call this series One YouTuber You Really Need to See, Creator Spotlight. All you need to do is follow the link in the description to High Impact Flicks, drop a comment in the video letting them know that you like my channel and you'd like to see them feature it. This could be a great opportunity for a larger channel to get the word out about my channel and for you all to know about this other channel, High Impact Flicks, if you don't know already. A great channel. I recommend you subscribe to stay informed. I love each and every one of you. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good one.